the mic on? Can you hear me? Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Okay, we're going to get started with our next panel conversation on AI ethics. So I would just ask you to take a seat so that we can get started. And um, bah, bienvenue à notre panel. Bon après-midi. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome Jonathan and Ellie here on the stage. And I'm going to do a short introduction in a minute for all, to all our panelists. And we're going to be joined by Connor and Serena virtually. I hope they're, they're appearing on the screen sometime soon. Hi, Connor. Hi, Serena. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure to have a conversation about AI ethics. Um, we started already this morning but lots of conversations about AI policy and AI regulation. In some ways, now on AI ethics, we're taking it almost a level higher up. We're going to talk a bit more broadly about, okay, what are the actual values and ethics that we are we think should apply to AI systems? And, and then more broadly, or more maybe importantly, um, how do we actually enforce that? And, and how do we decide on them? And then how, what, what do we do about them? How do we actually have these more ethical um, and sometimes interchangeably use the word responsible AI um, to to AI systems. Um, I'm really delighted to um, introduce my panelists because we have a really great mix on the panel today of people who actually work in industry or at least alongside industry. Um, we have an um, academic on the panel and we have someone a bit more from the civil society. So it's a good mix and different perspectives on when we have this conversation of about um, AI ethics. Um, and so I'm going to start actually with in the introduction to our to the panelists online that are joining us online. Um, first one is Connor Wright, who is sorry, I'm, um, who is a partnership manager at the Montreal AI Ethics Institute. He is unfortunately not joining us from Montreal today, but actually from Cambridge. Um, but he has a lot to say about, um, especially kind of the human technology interface and how to think about that and how to think about any kind of ethical consideration, therefore. Um, I'm equally delighted to be joined by Zarina Aliata, who is a principal AI strategist with Amazon. Um, and she works with lots of clients um, to really think through like not only the opportunities of AI, um, but also then what are some of the risks that could come with it and how to think about AI ethics in a more industry context. Here on the stage, I'm joined by Ellie Evans, who is a policy and responsible AI strategy lead at Cohere for AI, which is the nonprofit arm of Cohere, um, the company Cohere that also works on generative AI um, applications. And I'm joined by Jonas Duran Falco, associate professor at St. Paul University. Um, he has also just published a book about actually AI governance that he's going to talk a bit more about. So welcome to all of you. Hi. Thank you. Okay, thank it's you. a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to start with a question in a way for everyone as a bit as an intro question. Um, and, I'm, and we're going to, by the way, talk a bit about risks um, and some of the risks, maybe some of the risks that are we talk a lot about, maybe also then some of the risks we talk less about. And then we're going to move more to some of the kind of what I call the solution spaces. So then if we, we talk about these risks, how can kind of AI ethics or more ethical approaches to AI use, how do we actually then think about them in the real world and how can they help us, guide us, in addition, by the way, to kind of legislative and regulatory approaches, right? So as I said, like AI, the AI ethics space, I think is just a bit broader. And so we'll talk, um, but we'll start a bit with the risk analysis. And I'm gonna start in a way where many of us started today already is around the conversation of generative AI because it really has changed the conversation. So with the, the in, in, in some ways, not only like generally generative AI, but specifically, of course, an application that we all know, and I think many of us use, that is ChatGPT. So all of a sudden we have a tool, a generative AI tool in the hands of everyone. Everyone can access it. Um, that is, is built on a very large language model and that I think is partly fascinating for everyone um, in terms of its capabilities, but also I think at the same time very clearly poses some really, really important questions about the ethics and, um, you know, and, and, and the opportunities, of course, at the same time. So given that we have a generative AI tool out there in the world and that it has changed the conversation so much, to all of you, what's the number one, I would say, myth um, you see about the risks of AI in the public discourse, and what's the number one risk that you think people are actually not talking enough about and are overlooking 
Um, so what is what kind of what are the, the, the issues that are overhyped and what are the ones that are really underrepresented in the conversation? And I'm actually going to ask um, Ellie to start, and then um, we're going to go online and, and end with you, Jonathan, particularly. Yeah, I would say that a myth that's top of mind for me these days is the idea that the systems, the advanced AI systems that, that do exist today um, are not propagating harm. I think in the media, there's a lot of attention surrounding the existential risk that advanced AI systems pose. Um, and the real concern that's top of mind for me these days is ensuring you know, we're in an era of mass, mass adoption. Startups, small and medium-sized businesses, enterprises are adopting uh, generative AI technology today and productionizing that. Um, and there are limitations that exist with, with current, uh, current language models and real opportunities to mitigate those risks throughout the development and deployment pipeline. Is there a particular risk that you um, maybe could point us? Like, is there a specific har or harm that you, you currently see that you would like to kind of yes. pay a bit more attention yeah. to? Yeah. So one example is hallucination. Uh, language models are imperfect, and uh, they are capable of generating misinformation. Um, and that becomes a serious problem when it comes to things like over-reliance individuals accepting model outputs as truth, as fact. Thanks a lot. Um, Connor, I'm going to hand it, uh, pass it over to you. What are, what are the kind of risks you're seeing over or, and underreported? Mm -hmm. No, thank you so much. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. This is double yep, fantastic. No, thank you so much for having me here. An absolute pleasure. So sorry I couldn't be there in Montreal with you today, but now uh, phoning in from a, a nice dark Cambridge um, as it's an evening for me. But so for the myth wise, what I'm seeing uh, in terms of AI risks is that we're on this very techno deterministic path and that generative AI is the only way and the only solution that we're going to follow. And I think for me personally, that is a, is a very dangerous point of view. Um, I think it very much exculpates the technology from any form of scrutiny. And just accepting that this is the way we're going doesn't actually allow us to properly analyze the technology, properly assess whether we need to use it or not, and actually properly assess the opportunity costs of using it. And this is where I think one of the AI risks that isn't uh, covered nearly enough is actually the uh, opportunity cost of using this technology, and mainly in terms of the planetary costs as well. So you just need to take a look at uh, Taiwan during 2021, where they had uh, a severe drought, you know, lack of typhoons thanks to, to global warming, uh, meant that their water uh, reservoirs were not properly filled. And as a result, uh, farmers who were growing rice were actually encouraged not to grow rice. They were actually paid not to grow rice. And this was because the water that's usually flowing to the rice fields is actually being redirected to uh, the TSMC the Taiwanese semi uh, TSCM, sorry, Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturer, basically the company that con uh, constructs a lot of the chips that go into our iPhones and the generative AI as well. And the water is being directed there in order to cool their facilities. And these are the kinds of opportunity costs that we need to, to look at. And then you can look towards the health sector as well, where if we're just going to throw technology at the problem, then there's also causes some issues if we don't properly scrutinize it as well. You just need to look at uh, deploying chatbots as basically replacements for uh, human helpline operators, where uh, in one context, uh, the let me check my notes, the National Eating Disorders Association, just um, what they did was that they cut their human helplines and replaced it with Tessa, a basically helpline chatbot to streamline costs. And as a result, within days, it was already providing harmful advice to those suffering from anorexia. And these kinds of scenarios where we haven't quite analyzed why we need to use the technology and ask that question, I think is a, is a huge issue. And we haven't on, analyzed the opportunity cost of actually deploying that technology and the, the, the actual consequences that then result from these decisions. So I would say the, uh, the myth is that we're on this techno deterministic path and that's where we're going. And I would say that what is not really being uh, reported enough is the opportunity cost of using this technology.
Thanks a lot, Connor. And so that means, I mean, when you talk about opportunity costs, you mentioned examples both in a way from the supply chain overall, right, when we deploy AI, as well as the actual use of AI. And then in, in, then in both instances, we can see harms or, or really high opportunity costs that might be, might be hidden. Um, thanks so much. Um, so, Zarina, over to you. Yeah, sure. So, um, I, I just uh, want to say, first off, that I, I think generative AI is an awesome technology. <laughs> I am a huge fan, and I think it's here to stay. So, we just have to you know, make sure that we guide everything the right way. Um, I think one of the myths that I'm hearing, uh, and I'm reading in the news every day, is that AI will take all of our jobs. I hear this constantly, and it's one of the most common questions that I get when I go to speak somewhere, what jobs is AI going to replace and how? Um, and I don't think that that would be the case at all. As, as a matter of fact, I started a, a PhD in, in this domain specifically to do some serious research and see exactly how AI will replace any type of jobs that we do. Um, but what I'm seeing so far is it's, it's not going to be like that. It's not really going to happen like that. What happens is our jobs will change, right? We will have to just do different activities, different tasks. Um, just like, you know, maybe 20 years ago, we had folks who were making a living by, I don't know, checking inventory and counting boxes, right? And now we don't do that anymore. That's automated. But it doesn't mean that, you know, those people never got any other job in their lives, right? They, their job changed. Now they had to use a program maybe to do the same thing. So it's very interesting to me, and I think that it's something that we need to study and really understand because it will affect how society moves forward, how education will be focused on what we focus on to educate our children uh, in order to you know, make the best of this technology. Thanks so much, Irene. I think that's a, the, the risk of kind of labor market disruption um, and replacement of jobs is one that I think we've, we've heard about at least for the last 10 years. And I think any predictions that we've seen um, actually have been proven mostly wrong, interestingly. I think it's very hard to predict these kind of things. But yeah, interesting myth, I think, that has been kind of proven wrong might still be right in some shape or form. But I think so far the predictions have been, have been pretty, um, pretty bad, actually, about these. Um, these things, um, or the accuracy of them. Um, Jonathan, over to you. Yes, uh, on my side, I was going to say this also, but uh, quite a little bit differently, because I think that AI won't steal our jobs and it won't be like mass underemployment after that. But at the same time, uh, I think a myth is that AI tools or algorithmic machines are autonomous systems that don't need uh, that don't need human beings. And I think that it uh, it, um, it is a way to frame AI as a purely mechanistic system, and at, at, and at the same time, it, it is based on human digital labor. And like in the literature, we call it ghost work. And actually, we need more humans to train AI and to code and to train AI. At the same time, we have to adapt, as my colleague said. But I think the risk is that it will inter intensify exploitation. It will increase the precarization of jobs because uh, if we take the example of chat GPT, we know that we had to code it and to make it uh, clean and ethic, uh, ethical because it doesn't have to say like uh, vi violent and sexist and racist uh, sentences to people. But to train it, we needed some Kenyan workers working in the global south for less than two dollars per hour and like and many AI tools like in Amazon they need Amazon mechanical Turks it's actually human beings that work in this kind of job so I think that we need to focus on what who works on AI uh, like engineers and uh, data scientists but actually the international division of labor all across the world also Thank you so much. So the risk, so the myth is more the labor disruption that we can expect, and the the real maybe risks are really a bit more about the actually labor standards and the labor yeah. regulation that we see um, often being very much ignored. And or yeah, great book by the way, Atlas of AI. If you want to read more about that okay. um, that question. Um, thank you so much. So we talked now a bit about you know the different risks and the kind of and your um, your sense of what are more myths and what are the actual real risks that should, we should be worried about. Um, to come back then to AI, AI ethics, and often I find 
in the conversations that I'm in, AI ethics is, is used a bit as a, as a general term to address any of these risks. In addition to regulation, of course, and legislation that we talked a bit about, AI ethics is a bit the, the word that is thrown in there. And often, and at least my experience is, a lot of people define quite differently and understand very different things, what it actually means. And also it's a bit vague and people can kind of get away with it, it seems. So I would love to spend a bit of time to really just unpacking a bit how you encounter, in a way, the term AI ethics and what do you understand, what it means in your specific context that you work in. So be that in industry, academia, like how do you, yeah, how do you encounter it and where, how does it show up in a way, AI ethics as a, as a term and as a concept? And then we're gonna go a bit more into then, okay, well then what it actually means to, to apply it. But let's start with the definition more. And um, I'm actually gonna start with, with you, Zarina. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Zarina, yes. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, so for us uh, in industry, um, it is not vague. Uh, we, we have a pretty clear framework. Uh, we want to make sure that whatever we deliver is, is right and good, fair, and of course legal. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we comply with regulations, right, and um, whatever our customers have to, to respond to, whatever agencies they have to respond to. So we are pretty uh, prescriptive about how we um, uh, how we do responsible AI in, in, in practice. Um, and um, I can speak a little bit at a high level about the, the things that we consider because I think it's, it's quite interesting um, and it's been working quite well so far. Um, the first thing we look at is uh, uh, what we call value alignment. And that just means, are you sure you're doing the right thing? You're creating the right product? Is that product what you know a good thing for the company, a good thing for 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 your customers, for the society? Does it serve an actual purpose? And that is an actually very important question because many times we go chasing shiny things in the data uh, that don't actually you know don't have a real value for for anyone. So just making sure that whatever we do is shows our, our values as a company, as a society, right? Uh, that is the first thing that we look at. Then, of course, privacy and security of data, making sure that there's no no one, you know, t uh, being able to touch the data without, you know, a clear purpose of so data governance, um, ensuring that from a technical point of view, uh, the fairness of the algorithm, um, understanding what exactly it does and how it affects the audience in, you know, as much detail as possible. And with that, the transparency and interpretability of models, explainability, uh, if you're familiar with the terms. So we do that by uh, making sure the models are low risk technically in the sense that we can tell what they do uh, or by using libraries like Lime and SHAP and so forth, uh, technical methods to obtain the transparency. Um, but what I like, and that's from a kind of a technical point of view, what I like the most is that we also have a people uh, a dimension to this, and that is we have to keep, we have to hold the people who design the system accountable. We are accountable for the design of the product. We cannot say the AI did it, the chat GPT did it. It, it should be, the responsible should, the responsibility, the accountability should lie with us. We are enabling that system. We are designing that system. So the, the fact that we, we take accountability for what it, it, it does and what it puts out in the world. Uh, with that comes, we want to make sure that people who work on this are, are trained uh, in AI and they understand, you know, what what the, what is going on. And the last thing that we do, and I'm, it, we actually insist on this, is that the team that actually works on the product is as diverse as possible. We want to make sure all the angles and the points of view are, are represented at that table. Sorry if I took too long. No, no, that's great. Thank you so much. So lots of um, quite a robust framework, ethical framework um, and, and process for you. Connor, I'm going to go to you next. Um, how does, you know, AI ethics, you know, show up in your in your work and, and how is it defined in your in your context? Mm -hmm. No, thank you so much. And, you know, to echo what, what Serena was saying as well, I really like the, 
mention of the human aspect as well and the the talk of that kind of integration of the different perspectives because that's exactly how, how i see ai ethics as well is that it's very much approaching you know an ai related issue in in an interdisciplinary way looking to create that kind of equitable and appropriate uh, decision and an outcome and whatever is determined as right can depend on the context but for me it must come through the right channels and i think that can be pretty universal in the sense of coming through an interdisciplinary kind of perspective. You know, we can't just rely on having lawyers and engineers in the room. You got to save space for a little, little old philosopher like myself, and and also you know just consulting with with those who who are not me, merely just involved in technology, but come from all walks of life. A uh, big sort of tenet of of my work is to appreciate how um, very many people, whether you're involved with the technology or not, have a say. In, in the AI debate. And I think actually consulting the people who you're trying to design this product for is, is essential to that. So I think for me, AI ethics is, is more so a method, so an approach and trying to get the, the appropriate outcome for, uh, for the decision for the AI related problem through the right channels. And that right channel for me is an interdisciplinary discussion where we're considering those different points of view and actually taking into account what that could mean for these people's lives. Thanks so much, Connor. So these are two amazing answers, and I think um, based on that, everything should go really well. Um, <laughs> and yet, um, things are not going always so well, and, and that's partly, of course, why we're thinking about um, regulating and legislating this, because we do see actual real risk and real harms occur, and, and Ellie, you already um, you know, talked a bit about that. So what are the actual like day-to-day -day challenges and barriers to adopting some of these really good practices and ethical principles that we just heard about? Yes, that's an excellent question. I would say that responsible use of these models is, is a shared burden by the entire ecosystem, from the folks that develop and deploy these models uh, to, the, to the businesses that adopt them and productionize them and, and the end users that interact with these systems. And I think as it stands today, AI expertise is not well distributed across the ecosystem. Uh, the, the businesses that are adopting this technology um, may not be equipped with the understanding of how to evaluate um, how, how to evaluate a model against their specific use case, um, how to build a user experience um, on top of these models in a way that doesn't propagate harm. And I think there is a real need to build resources, documentation, and tools that empowers the folks that are productionizing these models, as well as the individuals who are affected by these systems. Whether or not they're using the ChatGPT iOS app or not, uh, you know, there's an increasing amount of generated media that we're all coming across. And I think it's really important that we equip ourselves with um, a critical thinking framework when it comes to discerning um, generated media that we might be coming across. So there's a, a clearly need like then a bit more for, I mean, a general public education and awareness, but really even actually those who work on this also need to constantly, I think, learn. We come back a bit maybe to the topic of, of kind of capacity building and AI literacy or especially ethical or responsible AI literacy in a, in a bit. But on, on maybe the topic then of, of it, so in the absence of any kind of currently I mean, not total absence, by the way, but formal legislation and regulation on general AI types. I mean, some things in the works, but currently we don't have it. Um, how, what can actually, I mean, what can the private sector do to, to bring potentially a bit more accountability, but also, you know, yeah, I mean, how, how do you actually adopt some of these AI ethics and practices? And maybe, Jonathan, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, although that you're not in industry, but what, what are the kind of things that you've seen that could kind of work? And then I'll let maybe also um, Ellie and Zunira respond a bit to that. What, what do they see and what, what, where does the private sector need to step up? Yeah, I think for the private sector, I'm not an expert because I come from academia, I come from critical theory research, and I've seen a lot of things going on, like with the codes of conduct and uh, declarations for responsible AI, like in Montreal in 2016. 2017 and 18, and try to implement and code ethics, like uh, trying to program good robots or algorithms that that 
reduce the harm and try to maximize the social positive impact on the people at the same time. I think that's quite good, but at the same time, we, we need to, uh, again, try to think about not only about programming good algorithms, but do we need more algorithms, uh, algorithms and more good robots and instead of doing uh, something else. So that's one thing I think that the industry doesn't do all the time. They try to focus on I'll try to build new solutions, but sometimes it's not new solutions. We, we need kind of non-technological solutions to try to resolve social or environmental issues at the same time. So that's my critical stance about it. But at the same time, I'm not in the industry and I'm not an expert about what's going on and what are the good practices going on now. So. So I might not always be the solution to begin with. Yeah. Um, however, if we are, you know, excited about the opportunities and the solutions that AI offers, maybe Zarina and, and Ellie, what, what do you see? Where does it actually then kind of, you know, stick? Like, where does it doesn't work? Where, where are these, these principles that you, off, you set out already in the beginning, Zarina? I mean, where do you see them being practiced or maybe not so much practiced and why? Oh, that, that practice, um, everybody wants to do the right thing, right? It's not like we're set out to do evil. Uh, we really want to do the right thing. Um, for me, what I see a, a main problem is you mentioned it's not enough regulation. So we don't know what was year two. And even the, the regulations that is out there, it's mostly about recognizing that there's a risk, but there isn't anything that says what to do about it. Uh, it doesn't require a mitigation necessarily. Um, so for us, right, that leaves us, well, what can I do? I don't want to do harm. I don't want to do a bad thing, but how can I mitigate that risk? I understand. And, and I tell you an example is uh, data. In practice, in real life, we rely on data for everything. Otherwise, there is no AI, there is no machine learning without uh, data. Our data, our historical data, reflects our faults as a society, right? Our, our past is not always something we're proud of. How do you take that type of data where we openly discriminated and legally discriminated against entire categories of people and try to feed that into the, the good robot and say, but don't do that into the future, right? That is the real problem. Uh, well, not the only problem, but one of the main problems. The data is not fair because it's just not, but it is historically correct. So what do we do about that, right? Again, there is no clear indication in any of these rules or regulations. Should we go and alter history? Should we go and pretend that that didn't happen? So we teach the machines the right way? Where is that line? And I think that that's what we're struggling with. And that's where the, the, the practicalities of it really uh, hit the road. Ellie? Yes, Zarina mentioned data. What's top of mind for these for me these days is evaluation. I think there's a real opportunity to, as a, a community, improve the way we approach identifying the limitations of these models. I think as it stands today, evaluation is largely a black box, um, especially for industry. Um, industry players um, might disclose that they've evaluated their models, um, but might not be transparent when it comes to whose perspectives they optimized against um, and the exact, the exact ways they approached evaluation. And I think transparency around evaluation and, and improving approaches is critically important for empowering those downstream developers, those businesses that, that are needing to evaluate for their specific use case, but maybe aren't sure how to go about identifying biases um, that might exist in their proprietary model uh, that they've trained. Interesting, and I'm maybe just uh, going a bit technical mm -hmm. because today already at, at the panel on regulation, we talked a bit about algorithmic auditing as one of the tools. I mean, you mentioned the word um, evaluation. We have impact assessment tools out there. Um, some of them more around ethical principles, some of them really then more around regulation. Um, maybe to all, all panelists, like what are the some of these tools that you've seen that bring a bit more of a, you know, um, a bit more accountability and transparency to some of these more general principles 
and, and which one of these tools have you seen works really well um, and are actually, I mean, also to a certain degree user friendly, because I think that's always a bit the, the question from industry that I hear quite often that will, you know, an impact assessment tool that takes me a week to, com you know, fill out is not very, is not very useful for me. It adds a lot of kind of in a way red tape. Anyone who wants to jump in on that. Evaluation, auditing, impact assessment tools. Go Maybe ahead, Jonathan. I could try to jump. Yeah, um, actually, there are several tools now. Some are used by the industry, some are used by the cities and uh, several, uh, at several scales at the same time. And I think in the academia, we have several tools at the same time. And uh, there are, like, for responsible AI, which is a main discourse, there are several things happening. And the people that are using the term uh, are not saying always the same thing at the same time. So there are some people using political philosophy, some others are using critical sociology, and uh, some people want actually to, uh, to challenge the systems of domination and power systems beyond in, inside those algorithmic machines. Some of them want to guide and to implement something better inside the actual systems. So I think that there's kind of a battlefield and kind of messiness of tools. And we have to see what are the actual discourses beyond, uh, actually underneath the terms that we use and to see the actual practices in the industry, in the public, regulations to see what are people doing. So I think like for me, I come from a social innovation department and in social innovation, we have social economy, social entrepreneurship, we've got some activism, we got many things happening at the same time. It's a broad field and it's fun because we can exchange with, it, with each other and but we don't always share the same, the same political view about what's going on now. So that's big like, I'm just trying to put some interro. <laughs> yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a bit messy. There's yeah. there's a lot of out there, and people talk about different things. Um, sometimes mean the, mean the same, and, and and vice versa, right? So it's it's a bit messy, and so there are lots of lots of options. Um, but maybe back to to that question: What kind of tool, though, have you seen actually then therefore work well, and which ones have you where you actually saw adoption by industry, for example, that bring partly yeah like an evaluation or like very often like a post. Um, ex post, you know, check on, hey, is it actually working what we're doing here? And are there some harms that we should, you know, really mitigate against? Um, I can try Please. a quick answer to this. I, I can't like name names of <laughs> uh, specific vendors or anything like that we work with. But um, just to say that in general, like I mentioned, we use uh, um, libraries like Climb and SHEP to, for transparency and to explain the models. And those are common, commonly used. Um, and also our products have, you know, that um, uh, like our product page maker has a, a explainability a feature as well. So whatever model we have, we try to make sure that it is explainable and transparent to everybody how it works. So the, those are normal basic tools, standard tools that we use. That being said, we have our own proprietary tools to develop the assessments and to develop the measurements. Um, and while there are some out there in the industry, again, I can name exactly what we're working with, but there are several uh, uh, vendors and companies who are developing their own uh, tools to, to help with that, with uh, the measurement of, uh, you know, the uh, auditing, uh, how the models are performing. Thank you. I'm gonna then move a bit to the, the AI kind of education literacy that again also came up in, in several panels already today and that you mentioned already, Ellie. Um, so, I mean, one, one approach is to also educate, of course, everyone who is working in AI a bit more around or, or sensibilize around some of these risks and, and, and have them think about some of the ethics that are, you know, that might need to be applied here. So could you maybe talk a bit about some of the kind of responsible AI literacy and education approaches that have, you have seen either in industry or also elsewhere? And then we will also talk a bit more about the, about the general public part of that. Definitely. For this question, I'd actually like to pass it back to you. Um, I recently discovered the trail 
framework that you were involved in through Mila. Uh, would you like to spend some time sharing about that? Oh, <laughs> my favorite topic. This was not planned, by the way. Um, so Mila, um, yeah, by the way, I should maybe actually have introduced myself. Um, I'm the director of public policy and learning at Mila, and Mila has just um, developed a program that hopefully um, um, supports both researchers and now industry in um, thinking more, basically by thinking more about all the ethical considerations in throughout the AI life cycle, so throughout AI life cycle project. Um, very much with this, I think, the belief and, and the fact, and I don't know if, if many of you know that, but most computer scientists, even in a, in, in, in a PhD program or postdoc, have had zero um, exposure through courses, for example, um, to AI, I mean, be it ethics or any ethics class, mm -hmm. um, et cetera. So there, as, as opposed to engineering, for example, where very much that is embedded in, in, um, in most university training. Um, so there is just a partly a lack of, of exposure to the topic of ethics in computer science, and that's something partly that we're trying to address with the program that we offer. Um, but I'd be really curious to, to throw it back to, to our panelists. What, what kind of, um, yeah, what have you seen in terms of level of knowledge about ethics, but also what are kind of other education initiatives that you know, could partly upskill everyone who works on AI around ethics? Connor, and then Jonathan. No, thank you so much. So what we do at the Montreal AI Ethics Institute is to aim to democratize AI ethics literacy. So by doing that, we aim to do that through one of our two branches, which is either our content or community side. And our content can be about you know, our blog and our newsletter and our, and our community side is more so about getting people to, together. And I think when we've seen these two mesh really well, is we set up a learning initiative. So we had people apply in and basically we set up like a, a learning community where we had like basically elaborated a, a syllabus and we had about 10 weeks of content. And in the room, we had mathematicians, we had engineers, we had journalists, we had lay people. And what I found very, very interesting was actually the, the self-learning going on and actually the, the dialogue between the participants was really, really useful. So I found that actually in terms of the initiatives and, and education that, that really, really work, it's having that kind of base level of introduction. So, you know, you give an AI ethics, maybe just 101 uh, base level intro to the topic and which I've, I've given some myself and basically also mentioned that you can't solve ethics within a two hour lecture. Unfortunately, I've, I've spent a degree on it. I promise you can't. Uh, and in this kind of, uh, with this kind of background learning, you can then actually allow people just to formulate their own kinds of thoughts on the topic as well. And it's amazing the kinds of thoughts, discussions, and ideas that come out as a result of this kind of dialogue. So when, when I think of these kinds of initiatives, I always look for where's that dialogue element involved? Where can people learn from each other and interact? And actually just go from a, a joint platform together that they, they might have some knowledge they brought in, but actually can go from, from that same base knowledge and can actually then bring in their own experience, mix it around, and then share some, some truly inspiring ideas. So these kinds of initiatives where I've seen people actually interact with each other, I've seen the most success. Super. Thank you so much, Connor. I think that's really interesting because I think all, in my experience as well with the trail program, I mean, ethics is not an answer. Ethics is a, is a, a process of reflection ultimately in conversations, right? And, and that's, I mean, just even pausing and, and often I think in a, such a fast paced um, system, just the pausing and reflecting is the part that is actually the most valuable and it's less about certain principles, but that, that conversation, that, that reflection, mm -hmm. ideally yeah. in a multidisciplinary kind of context. So yeah, thanks so much, Connor. Jonathan. Exactly. To give another example at St. Paul University, my, co my colleague Julie Paquette organized the winter school on AI and ethics and she in invi invited many people, guests from the industry, colleagues, computer scientists, people from the social science, critical theory, activists to, to discuss together. And the main people that were there, the students were people from the federal government actually and the public servants. So they were trained to think about AI in an interdisciplinary way. way. So I think that we need more, those, well, more of those types of courses like crash courses uh, that, uh, that last for one week or two or three weeks, let's say. And, uh, and I think that there should be 
mandatory courses from every person uh, that are trained in AI, let's say in the neuroscience, it could be in computer science also, courses on ethics. I think that should be mandatory everywhere uh, uh, on the globe actually, and it's not the case now, so yeah. All right, so more ethics I, for the world. Zarina. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I, I absolutely agree. I think we, we need so much AI. We need, uh, you know, and, and at all levels. I've, I've created a, an AI course for leaders at the Georgetown University in DC because there was nothing at the top, right? Our executives in business have to understand what this is and, and, and what it does for them, uh, not just, you know, only producing engineers, right? But I think that one of the funniest things that happened to me, I was going around speaking about AI for, you know, I've been doing for years. And one time I was invited to a school and I assumed it was the high school. No, it was the first grade. They wanted me to speak with seven year olds about robots. <laughs> uh, and at first I was freaked out, <laughs> but then I decided that's awesome. So uh, I had a, an amazing day. And I realized that children are very much open to this. Um, there is one theory that if you bring the machines into the classroom, just like children, right? We treat them like children that are learning. Maybe they will pick up some of this ethical, um, you know, com from conversations, just concepts, just by raising them together with our kids. And I tell you, those seven-year-olds were so enchanted by this idea. And they said, please bring the robots to school with us, please. Um, so I think that children, even at that age, were so interested in technology, and I think that we can definitely start teaching them even then on how, you know, how to interact with the machines, what AI is, how to make the best of it, how to work with it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of educating all the way through. Thanks, Irina. Ellie, did you want to add something? Yeah, I think there's an interesting opportunity um, to bridge the gap when it comes to how to implement best practices, like translating the, translating the what to the how. Um, and so part of the work that I do through Cohere for AI centers on um, opportunities to foster AI literacy across the ecosystem, especially for downstream developers and the folks that are building uh, with this technology. Um, and yeah, I think there's a real, real opportunity to build collabs, um, write starter code that empowers folks to uh, fine tune um, a model, responsibly evaluate a model um, in the right way. So basically we need both more AI education and awareness across the board starting in, in grade one and we need more ethics education is what I hear. Mm -hmm. um, how, what are, like how do we like, so basically, how do we do that at a, at a scale? And I, I mean, I think I'm going to maybe bring it back to you, Jonathan, also to that, that, that part around um, citizen um, education. I know you work quite a bit on, on citizen participation and all of that as well. So how, what, are, what are, again, models or what do you see out there where you actually meaningfully bring citizens in and provide them with an, a better understanding of the technology, but also have them participate in the development of these, these ethics? Yeah, I, I think that there might be two complementary ways to do it. The first one about public participation on the political sphere and level, I think that we need to distinguish when we speak about participation, sometimes it's information, consultation, sometimes it's co-governance, and there are several scales of intensity about what we do. I think uh, we need to go beyond mere information sessions and, uh, and beyond public consultation. I think one thing that we could try to experiment is something like broad, a broad citizen assembly or a kind like in France there was this uh, citizens convention for climate uh, that, that, uh, that brought together 150 citizens that were randomly selected by sortition and then they discussed about the climate issue at large and then it was like uh, many, many months discussion uh, with the expertise of the industry, of people, of scientists, and then they brought 150 proposals to the government. The issue is that that was actually this assembly, this convention, they didn't have any power. So 
Emmanuel Macron just decided to pick and choose like the several regulations that fit uh, that fitted in his program, but the other one more radical pro proposals that challenge the status quo they didn't pass. So I think that that may be maybe a thing to try uh, and have a broad public discussion about AI at the national scale in let's say in Quebec, Canada, to bring a big citizen assembly to discuss about it, to make proposals, and then it could influence the public debate, uh, debate at large. Another thing, and I'll be fast about it, is about economic democracy. I think that beyond the consultation, we need to democratize the means of production and then the algorithmic production. So it means about ownership, about the digital commons, the free software, and uh, co-op platforms. And it could be a way to make citizens participate in the elaboration and the control of the industry, actually. So that's another pathway to explore about economic democracy. And if we don't go there, I think we'll only be, let's say, uh, always uh, late about what's going on in the private sector and trying to re regulate afterwards what's happening. And we need to take the control back of the industry. So that's one thing I could say. Reactions. Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciated what you shared. I think it's critically important that everybody has a seat at the table when it comes to what does effective governance of AI look like? That should be inclusive of industry players, folks in academia, civil society. Um, we, we really need to work together in multi-stakeholder initiatives um, uh, are, are, are very important. Connor? Uh, that guy I've mentioned before as well, I think that kind of seat to the table, multi-stakeholder engagement, as, as Eddie was saying as well, is, is fantastic. And I think those are the kinds of insights that, that we're looking for. And uh, I can give you one that, that came out from, from one of our learning community discussions, and it was that um, we we're talking about data privacy, and we had people from we had people from Ukraine, we had people from England, we had people from the West Coast, we also had people from um, Mexico as well. We're talking about data privacy and how uh, Alexa would then listen in uh, without you knowing and then take that into um, into account and maybe for training or, or whatever. And then some from uh, from the West were saying, oh, you know, that, that's not right. We need that, that to stop. And then actually, um, in terms of a facial recognition discussion as well, actually, uh, the people from, from Mexico, they, they said that, well, actually, we, we kind of like uh, that, that Alexa records these kinds of things because of the rate of, of violence um, against women in that country. And just having Alexa there to listen and to record those recordings then gives um, basically evidence and, and credence to, to their arguments should they, should they take it to court. And the same with facial recognition technology in Mexico City, there's uh, plenty of surveillance and then it actually deter, deters crime, whether you know that, that comes at a great cost of, of privacy as well. But it's getting those kinds of insights that you actually think and you stop and you say, okay, wow, you know, that's actually a good point that these kinds of technologies differ. And you won't get that if you just sit in the same room with the same five people and, and discuss the same issues. I think that kind of engagement is, is fantastic. Thanks, Connor. So, Rene, I'm going to give you the last word before we go over um, to the to the um, audience to ask, um, to, to receive questions from the audience. Already a heads up to everyone here in the room. Please just raise your hand if you have a question um, for our panelists and then also, there might be um, questions online, so please, online, if you have a question, just put it in the chat, and so someone will read it out loud. But, Serena, over to you in terms of... Um, yeah, I don't have anything specific to add more than I, I agree with, with the other panelists, so um, we can go straight to questions. All right. So, first question over there. I think someone is coming with a mic. Um, I'm Ross. I'm with Digital Moment, and um, you know we demystified at the top. Um, sorry, we we took away the myth of AI taking away our jobs at the start of this talk, and I think it has largely been inaccurate for about a hundred years that technology will replace our jobs. It just changes that landscape. However, what has been true has been uh, for the past century nearly is that the results of these technological changes has caused a significant amount of wealth inequality. Wealth inequality is at the highest it's been in 100 years. Um, given that AI and all the investment is practically a gold rush now, will the implementation of AI 
exacerbate wealth inequality? And should that consideration be made in its development? Um, and I just want to say that I appreciate you bringing up the um, economic de democracy part of that. So thank you. Oh, Maybe I could try yeah. to answer. Actually, I think that the inside our economic system, AI will accelerate, amplify, and automatize inequality uh, on the economical sphere, social sphere, and the political sphere. So I think that we should, at the same time, try to put some public regulations on AI and algorithms, but on the, on the private sector and companies to share the benefits of AI, actually. So I think that's a broader question about, about distributive justice and how we try to share, and actually not only the citizens and individuals, but the businesses have to share their benefits with the public, with the public sector, and I think that's a matter of social ju social justice. So I think that AI could help us as, uh, let's say, as a humanity, but in the actual trajectory of AI in the capitalist system, it's not going like in the best direction now. So I think we could try to move it. It's not technological determinism, but I think that we could try to put more social democracy in it and try to redistribute wealth actually but maybe could i maybe follow up and, and again maybe also for for all panelists to, to answer but couldn't also some of the tools that we have already at our disposal like a competition bureau right like etc or taxation um, help with that as well or is that do we need new tools in the area of ai question whoever wants to jump in yeah. just people online Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> you see? Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, but, but does it, new, it needs new tools, you mean, though? So the, the ones that we have already at our disposal, some of the, the, the tools are not enough? Is that what you're saying? From my perspective, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. From my perspective, yes. The existing tools, the history, the data set that we have on technological advancement is a major contributing factor to income inequality. So I would believe that new tools are required, much in the framework that he yeah. was describing. Yeah. If I can jump in, uh, I, I think that there's an idea that could get some agreement from the left, the center, and the right at the same time, and comes actually from activists, from ecologists, from the left-wing parties, and at the same time from the Silicon Valley, and it's the universal basic income, actually. And some people say maybe we, could, we should try to tax the robots and tax like the the AI industry more and bring a universal basic income from every individual that could foster and try to, uh, yeah. So I think that that should be one way to redistribute, uh, to redistribute wealth, actually. Yeah. I'm, gonna, mm -hmm. I'm gonna throw this back though to our two more industry um, panelists. Like what, what does it, does that resonate? Do you see those kind of proposals? How do they resonate within industry? <laughs> Ellie, maybe. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. I mentioned in a, a previous question the importance of improving the way we evaluate systems, like their propensity to generate um, hallucination, um, bias. I think there's also uh, a real opportunity to improve the, the way we approach evaluation of the impact that these systems have on our larger society as well. Including economic impact. Yes, and trust in media mm -hmm. as well, and, and driving a feedback loop when it comes to the types of applications we do and do not support. Serena? Yeah, as, as, as for me, I, I, you know, I love technology. <laughs> I, I think, I mean, I think it can be the solution to a lot of our problems. And I'm no, you know, policy expert. I'm no, you know, uh, I don't know how, you know, I'm not an economist, but, um, uh, I truly believe that we can use technology for good, and and all I know is that there are a lot of people, and the fact that we're having this conversation right now, there are a lot of us who want to use technology for good, so we can get to that great place, right, when a lot of the tasks are just done by, you know, computers and Zoom instead of the abacus, right? We can get to a better place by using technology. We just have to be careful about it. But I'm super optimistic that a lot of a lot of people are working towards that. 
Um, so I think that we can get it done carefully and, you know, but we can get it done and we should keep going forward. Questions from the audience? Yeah, I've got a question from online. It's uh, from Garth Graham. Uh, Garth says, the idea of model implies a set of assumptions that structures a narrative or, in essence, a story. But a life is a complex adaptive system where, where what happens next is not predictable and is not a story. Does this mean that an AI that structures a narrative about me will always miss the point? <laughs> wow, it's going very deep here. That's a good um, question. <laughs> like to jump in so I can maybe jump in um, so you know really really nice question and I think it it phrases the, um, the sort of the golden ticket of AI and predictive AI in that sense very very succinctly and I think you know if AI could take all your past data let's say AI let's say um, we can say a large language model or we can say recommend the algorithm uh, it's basically what they're trying to do. They're trying to predict your, your preferences. They're trying to create a basic digital double of you and to pursue that, whether it be your YouTube recommendations, um, supplying more videos about cats and predicting that you actually want to carry on watching videos about cats, or the Amazon algorithm trying to suggest that actually you need more garden hoses because you've bought lots of attachments recently. And I think that's the golden ticket. So by training on that past data that, that you've supplied, whether it be the websites you've viewed or your past shopping history, it's trying to cr basically construct that kind of um, that kind of digital double of you. In that sense, it can only predict on the data that it has. So in terms of constructing a story about you and, and missing the point, it will only construct the story about the data that it actually has. So it knows the, the person online and what you've done. However, that's not your whole life. So within an AI system, there'll always be perhaps a kind of certain, uh, almost, you know, paradoxically, a certain uncertainty within that kind of story that there, are, there is data that, that this AI algorithm, whether it be a recommendation algorithm or a large language model, does not have. Um, and that I have not, for example, myself put digitally and therefore cannot predict. But these, this is basically the golden ticket. This is what its system, AI systems in general are trying to do, is that accurately predict the next move and whether you look at ChatGPT accurately predicting the next you know, useful word, um, it doesn't always get it right. And that's because there's, there's only so much data that, that's online and not all of it will be. So I think in terms of missing the point, AI systems will miss the point uh, in, in general. How far it misses will, will depend on, on how much, perhaps how much data it has and how much, uh, how much accuracy the, the system can enjoy as well. Thanks, Connor. Go ahead. Maybe to jump in, I, I would say that there's not only one narrative about AI, but many of them at the same time. And that's pretty interesting because there, there's an open, open future about what we will do about it. And I think that there are some narratives about existential risks and long-termism. Let's say that's what, uh, what one branch that exists now with Nick, uh, with Nick Bostrom and William McCaskill that try to think about the risks of AI in the long term. And uh, there is another narrative about responsible AI that we are discussing today. I think that we can see it as a discourse, as a worldview, as a narrative at the same time. We, we tell us a story about what we should do about AI, but that's one way to frame it. And there are other people who frame AI through the lens of degrowth or the Green New Deal, let's say. And other people, another discourse, which is pretty weird, is about, I don't know if you heard about it, it's uh, acceleration accelerationism, uh, accelerationism, like in French or in English. And it's, uh, uh, some people view that we should take back control of AI systems and bring fully automated luxury communism on the table. That's, that's another narrative about what we should do about AI. And I think that we need this big discussion about the full spectrum of discourses and narratives and see what, are, what we should do about AI. So responsible AI is one among many narratives now about what we should do about AI. Just Ellie, Zarina, did you want to add anything? Right. Uh, no, not for me. <laughs> right. Another question in the audience? Yeah, I wanted to, uh, to go back to, actually you anticipated what I wanted to say, Jonathan. Uh, so uh, I won't talk about accelerationism, but uh, 
close to. Um, a few months ago, uh, many leaders of the AI, they called for a pause, actually. It's not a, it's not a degrowth, but it's like a temporary pause. And, uh, and uh, I wanted to bring this subject here because um, Madame, uh, I don't remember. Serena. <laughs> Serena talk, uh, we should go forward with AI. Yeah. And, and uh, well, my question is, uh, should we really? Um, like uh, one way of uh, regulating could be to make a pause or to degrowth actually. It could be to accelerate, but I'd, I'd like to ask you like, <laughs> what uh, should we de should we just slow down at least and so we have time to think about this and and regulate and I'd like to have your <laughs> your personal uh, opinion like this uh, on this please and maybe to think about how to uh, cooperativize cooperativize uh, the, the <laughs> enterprise. <laughs> Fascinating question. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to give um, Ellie the first answer to this, and then um, I think it might be actually a good, good all panelist question. <laughs> Definitely happy to take that on. I think I am personally really excited about the potential for AI to transform our society for good. That being said, there are real risks that these systems pose with regard to the ways bad actors can potentially manipulate them to cause harm um, and, and the types of use cases that, that are supported by these systems. Um, and I think right now, it's really important that we have those multi-stakeholder conversations, that we bring together, together policymakers, regulators, folks from industry, academia, civil society to have a conversation surrounding what are the capabilities of these systems today? How do they work? What are the risks today? How do we imagine the risk frontier will evolve over time? And how can we effectively work together to ensure we're maximizing the benefits of this technology and minimizing the potential for risk? Serena? Sure, well, I mean, you know my position, right? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm all in and a big believer I think that uh, having a pause of probably not six months will not buy us much, but I understand why, uh, you know, people like us who've been working for years in, in AI ML, suddenly because of generative AI, now it's in the hands of everyone. And it does feel like, oh my God, what is going to happen? Where does all that data go, right? So it does feel like the risk has increased exponentially. So I can, I can understand why folks are like, let's put the brakes on for, for a little bit. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think that six months would make a difference one way or another. And I think that the bad actors will not take a six month break, even if us, the good ones will do. So I think that continuing these conversations and this time of type of discussions and just continuing all of us, the good work that we do, that is what is needed not to stop development. Thanks, Serena. Connor? Thanks so much. And it's interesting, you know, the, the paradox that's, that's very much apparent within this, this pause letter is that, you know, you've got um, big name players, I think, you know, Elon Musk, Sam Altman, they all signed it. Uh, and they could easily just say one day, actually, we're going to stop. That's it. We're just going to stop and that's it. Uh, but they don't. And it's very interesting that they're calling for their own regulation for something that they're developing themselves and not stopping to develop. And I think in that there's an interesting sentiment in terms of a lack of trust. I think that was mentioned in the, in the previous panel that I tuned in briefly to. And there is a sentiment that, okay, I might stop, but then this, this person won't stop, and then I'm behind the game. Uh, so I may as well, if someone's got to do it, then I must do it. And then you might look at the geopolitical level and say, you know, the U.S. is saying, like, well, we don't uh, use these chips for AI, then China will, and then that's like the end of the world. So the, these kinds of uh, sentiments and kinds of basically standoffs play out in these kinds of letters. I don't think six months is is any form of time, you know, at the, the pace that uh, legislation needs to move and, and sort of has to have discussions, you need like three, four years. Um, and then that, that unfortunately won't happen. So if that's not going to stop, and I, and I don't think it will, unfortunately, then we can look at the things that we can control. Can we position the people who care about these issues, like, you know, Zarina, for example, can we position them in these kinds of um, development roles where they can actually say, I'm going to do the right thing? 
And that's the kind of thing that we that we can control, that we can influence. And unfortunately, I don't think signing a letter, although you know a nice little sentiment, will uh, contribute to to that at all. And even if it does, six months is is no time at all. So can we actually influence the people in charge? And in terms, of, you know, when we talked about bad actors, can we have the right actors involved and minimise uh, the bad actors involved? And if we can't do that, can we at least develop these things in the right way that can mitigate those risks? Lord Connor, Jonathan. Yeah. And for me, I, I would say I would agree with the pause, but I won't think it, I think it won't happen actually because of the reasons that my colleague just said now, the panelists. And, but at the same time, I think on the collective level, on a collective uh, scale, we should slow down actually. The technological progress, just to think about it, to have time to exchange and to have this multi-stakeholder conversation going on and to take back control of the means of algorithmic production. So actually to make a slowdown, uh, we could try to bring all the good actors around the table. I think that's a way to put it. At the same time, I think it won't happen. And in order to slow down this economic system, we need to actually take back the democratic control of the means of production. But that won't happen if we'll just stay like this. And we have to have this bigger conversation about who controls wealth, economic decision making, political decision making at the same time. And that's a bigger conversation that I that could continue afterwards. So that's my position about it. We should slow down. It won't happen now, but we have to find a means uh, that we need to go in this direction. I, I feel like I, I feel the need to comment a bit as well, which is unusual for a moderator. But given that <laughs> Joshua Benji was the second signatory on this on this very letter, um, and I'm not going to speak on behalf of Joshua Benji at all, but it, I do have a bit of an insight of what the conversation around the or the motivation partly for that letter was. And, and I think that ultimately was about um, uh, just waving a flag and kind of bringing attention to, to the risks. I don't think that anyone was really thinking that, you know, tomorrow someone, you know, goes there and plugs out um, mm -hmm. the computer or the GPU in any of these organizations. Yeah. Um, and I think actually the organizations, including the signatories, didn't do it, which, you know, so I think it was less about the actual pause and more about saying, world, we, we, we are at a point and we arrived at this point a lot faster than we thought we would, that where we see now capabilities um, of some of these AI systems that really pose not only already kind of current harms and risk, but that will pose risks that are even even greater than what we currently can imagine. And so I think that that was the, the, the main intention, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, for, for this letter, and then somewhat at work, right? Like it actually, I think that the conversation has shifted. And all of a sudden, I mean, only about I think six days after the letter, the Biden administration for the first time really kind of went to um, on to, to really think about at least standardizing and regulating to a certain degree certain AI systems. So I think that that the general attention and focus that was that was the intention of the letter. And I think overall policymakers and governments are a lot more at least, um, yeah, pay more attention. What the actual then solutions are, and I think again, we, we talked about some of them from, you know, starting from education um, to awareness, to citizen assemblies, to potentially, you know, completely rethinking our, you know, economic systems, to, but actually to some things like bringing just some ed ethics education to developers, to regulation, to legislation. I mean, there is, there, it's not going to be the one solution, and I don't think there is the pause is, is going to be the solution either, the slowing down. But it is, I think, I, I, the conversation, I think, has shifted since the letter, and I think that's a really interesting, you know, just, that's just a fact. And that was the intention. Yeah, so two more minutes, so one last question, I think, over there. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and actually, there's an interesting uh, poll from the United States in July that came out said 82% uh, of Americans want to slow down AI versus accelerating it. So there's a lot of public support for a slowdown. Um, <laughs> on the note of speed of AI development, uh, going back to the question around education, how in your mind do you square the fact that as these systems are changing so rapidly, I mean, uh, uh, GPT-4 is, is tangibly different than models from five years ago. Um, is there a way to bring a large number of people into the democratic process, to help them understand what's going on when even the AI experts at the forefront are having a hard time catching up? Hmm. That's a good question. 
so I have a bit of a partial answer. <laughs> so I'm sorry about Kindle. Partly because, so um, no, but I think it does mean we need to have a different agility in kind of the systems we build around it. So I think it's a real challenge. I think policymakers across across the world have that challenge to a, I mean, catching up and understanding the the technology first of all, and then responding within a system that is not built for speed. Right, like democratic processes are not not built for speed. So that that's it's a real real challenge. And as I said, I mean, more than a thousand researchers over there at Mila are trying to catch up as well, right? And they are at the forefront of it. So it's it's really not an not an easy feat. Um, so I think ultimately we will meet again more more conversation, more translation between these different groups. I think is really really needed. Um, I'm a big fan of basically a, a much more structured science policy interface so that we have more ongoing conversations between policymakers and, and the scientists who are at the forefront of the technology so that there is just more, more uh, bridging between these kind of conversations. They're never going to you know, be expert in AI, but at least there is more, more conversations. Right now, it's a very siloed, yeah. um, siloed conversations. Sorry to jump in. I would agree with this. Yeah. <laughs> other other reactions, other ideas on what we can do then? And we're done. Big Let's plus one to taking an <laughs> agile approach to, to AI governance and ensuring that we have the, the right forum set up um, and, and communication channels um, to inform the way we approach that governance um, and recognizing that the capabilities of these models will continue to advance over time. Great. Yeah, I mean, from, from myself quickly is just what ties everything together, I think, is, is transparency as well. You know, the, the more accessible language that you use, the easier I'm going to be able to understand this technology. And the easier that these people involved in the democratic process are going to be able to get to get up to speed. So how transparent these businesses want to be is, is also a question. But I think being able to explain it in a way that's not only just you explaining it to me, but in a way that I understand will then actually help me keep at the forefront, you know, just at a basic level with you and be able to, to advise accordingly. So I think transparency will be key here and actually explainability in that sense as well, using language that people are actually able to, to understand. And uh, I just wanted to add that to that, that there are a lot of people working on this to make in the, that transparency even better. Uh, one trend is uh, what they call causality, to explain models, to provide context. Uh, so there is a lot of work being done to, 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 to enhance what we do right now so to, and to get better at it. Great. Well, I'm glad that we land on this positive note at the end. There's mm -hmm. lots more to do, a lot more translation, a lot more transparency that I think we can add to our, our systems in order to get to a more participatory and agile governance approach of AI. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank a you. huge thanks to all panelists. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Five minutes till... No, no, I, 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 I just want... I mean, I, I have no stakes in this. Five minutes or no break whenever the next panel is happening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Can you, oh, it's unmuted. Hi, everybody. Uh, I invite you to start taking your seats. We're gonna get started with the fireside chat in just a second. Um, so grab a seat. We'll have the fireside chat and then some quick closing remarks and then the cocktail hour. So stay patient because we've got a little bit of time to go, but it's definitely gonna be a good discussion. Um, and more, I'll welcome Maurice to the stage uh, from TikTok. Um, so Natalie Campbell unfortunately has um, a bit of a Franken flu and so will not be here with us today. Um, and so I will be moderating in Natalie's place. Um, and so I hope I can do her, her justice. Um, of course, Natalie actually used to work at CIRA and used to uh, organize the Canadian Internet Governance Forum when it first began back in 2019. Um, so it's not too much of a, of a, of a jump. Um, so we're going to cover a couple important topics today. Um, and I'm first just going to introduce myself a bit more comprehensively than I did before. Um, so by day, I, I manage CIRA's policy and advocacy activities uh, with the help of se several of my colleagues who play a supporting role there. Um, but I also am on the Internet Society Canada chapter board. Um, so also my connection to Natalie is that she works for the, for the mothership. Um, so I really do hope I represent them well. Um, and in previous uh, roles, I have worked with the Christchurch Call Advisory Network as the Canada lead for an evaluative project on the Government of Canada's implementation of the Christchurch Call to Action and have completed several big research projects about infrastructural approaches to content moderation and competition policy. Um, and so Maurice, I'll invite you to introduce yourself to the crowd and, and why you're here today and what you do. Bonjour, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, that brief introduction, hearing more about your role. Uh, my name is Maurice Turner. I work on the global public policy team at TikTok. And I like to think of myself as a technology translator. Uh, the very, very short version of what I do is I explain the tech stuff to the policy folks and the policy stuff to the tech folks. Uh, and I really appreciate having that kind of a role because it means that I need to get out, learn, listen, and understand to the point that um, I can help connect these, uh, these disparate communities uh, that oftentimes want the same outcome, but might have a little bit of difficulty understanding themselves. So thank you again for this opportunity to, uh, to chat. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say, um, you know, we really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be a sponsor of C uh, CIGF and be able to support these kinds of forums where we can have these conversations uh, amongst policymakers and stakeholders uh, so that we can try to get to uh, the root of some of these uh, very challenging problems that we're trying to address. Thank you. And so could you talk a bit about what drew you to TikTok and, and what you're working on right now? Sure thing. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm a tech translator and I've been doing that my entire career. Um, and uh, I think what brought me to TikTok was this idea that it's a really interesting tech policy challenge. Um, I can't think of a, another uh, organization uh, that has, uh, you know, such a, a positive um, reputation with users, but also so much attention from regulators. Uh, it, you know, in, in my time in, in tech policy, I'm now going into my, my third decade. Um, I've always been drawn to these, these challenges, uh, whether it be IT modernization or digging into uh, election security uh, or other infrastructure related issues. Um, this is one where, uh, you know, it feels pretty good to be able to work in a place where one, people have heard of it and, and two, folks generally have an opinion about it. And so uh, it keeps the conversation lively. Great, thank you. And of course, uh, people are opinionated about TikTok in several different ways. And so could you address some of the, the questions that you, you, know, you hear often about TikTok, uh, you know, sort of the elephant in the room? Um, so there's a lot of questions right now about privacy. Um, there's proposals both in Canada and in the US. Um, and then, uh, of course, you know, the company's origin and, and its data governance. Um. 
Well, I think right off the bat, it, it's important to recognize that TikTok is a global company. Uh, not only do we have users all around the world, but we also have staff all around the world. And I think that um, that kind of diversity really plays to our advantage. Uh, our CEO is he's, he's based in Singapore. We have executives in the States where I'm also based. And so I, I think that you know having that diversity, not only of geography, but also of talent, really helps us out. Uh, I think something that's overlooked is that TikTok is a relatively young company. If you're talking about uh, you know technology-based companies, uh, that have the, the kind of mind share that we currently have. You know, sometimes it takes decades to get to the level of popularity that we're at. And so I think that, uh, you know, we take that responsibility very seriously, uh, in particular, uh, in thinking about data privacy, uh, making sure that uh, not only is user data secure, but it's also uh, in, in servers and locations that help meet the, the creators and the users where they are. So making sure that there's that geographic uh, diversity in terms of, uh, of where we have the data, but also um, because we are a young company, we still have that mindset of growing and learning and applying those global learnings uh, in every jurisdiction where we are. Great, thank you. And so, in terms of, of where you are for Canada, um, where would the data storage locations be? Right, so uh, for Canadian users, that's, that's gonna be uh, in the States, also in Singapore and Malaysia. And as I said before, we take data security and privacy very seriously. Um, as some of you may have heard, uh, in, the, in the States, there is the USDS, so the United States Digital um, uh, Security, and uh, what's important to know about that is that's a, that's a special undertaking, right? That's, that's a serious investment in terms of policy and people uh, and also procedures to make sure that we're going above and beyond the expectations for, for data privacy. And we're taking those learnings and we're applying them everywhere we can. Great, thank you. And so obviously as a global company, you guys are, are wrapped up um, you know, in the conversations that are happening across the globe, especially in this geopolitical moment that we find ourselves in, which have served um, as a bit of the backdrop for today. So would you be able to address um, the China of it all? I know you get that question quite a bit. Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, uh, being a global company, uh, we appreciate the, this idea that you know, even though our parent company, uh, ByteDance, is based in China, that uh, TikTok as a subsidiary, we are not. Um, so as I said before, our CEO is based in Singapore. We have executives um, you know, in, in numerous countries, in, including the states. And our teams are, are based everywhere where we have a significant presence. And so I think that um, as additional investments are made, um, you know, you'll see the growth uh, in some areas. And that's important to recognize because you know our, our real strength at TikTok you know is our diversity in terms of uh, our staff um, and also our users and our creators, and I think that that's reflected throughout our our company's culture. Great, great. And so, against this you know geopolitical backdrop, um, there have been lots of discussions about the splinter net. Uh, or internet fragmentation. Uh, and it is unfortunate that Natalie couldn't be here today because the Internet Society authored a big report about internet fragmentation, um, which I, Maurice, I know you can talk to a bit and, and I can help fill in some blanks. Um, but TikTok has obviously been the target of efforts to ban the app. Um, in several jurisdictions, including in Canada recently, where its use was banned on government-issued devices earlier this year. So can you tell us a bit more about what's going on globally and then what concerns you about this from an internet governance perspective? You know, I, I really do wish that Natalie was here. She can speak more about that, that paper. I'll try to summarize it briefly. You know, um, ISOC, I think, put out this important paper uh, to help highlight some of the concerns um, that come along with this drive towards splintering the internet. Uh, and with that focus uh, that some jurisdictions have on targeting specific apps or specific services. And I think to wrap it up, you know, for me, what I get out of it was um, it does more harm to the users 
uh, to have that inconsistency across jurisdictions in terms of what apps and services are available. You know, not only are people using these apps and services for a variety of, of ways of not only getting information and communicating, um, but also f for just conducting their daily, their daily lives. So being able to do, uh, you know, shopping or, or travel uh, or research. And so by interrupting um, these networks, you also interrupt this, the, the global economy and it makes it much more difficult for businesses to do business across the world when there's that level of inconsistency. Right, and when you dig a bit deeper into the topic of internet fragmentation, um, you know, we, the, not to get too nerdy about it, but when you look at the OSI model of, of the different layers that build up the internet, um, you can use that as an entry point to think about um, how the splinternet is coming to be and, and where those sort of fracture points are coming to be. Um, historically, uh, it's been a priority to maintain the interoperability and cohesion of, of those lower layers. Um, but it is interesting to see how, when you take it from the user's perspective, that that fracture really does come from how they interact with the internet, which tends to be at that application layer um, every day. And so, and how, and the Internet Society paper really gets at how the quote unquote internet way of networking, how that serves as the foundation um, for the rest of the layers on the internet to, to also be cohesive so that we do have not a unified experience. Part of what the inter makes the internet so great is that there's the diversity of experience that you can have on there. It, it is meant for everybody, um, but, that, but that everything is available globally. Um, and so in terms of available information, is there anything you wanted to touch on uh, upon about, you know, the fractures that are coming at this, you know, layer seven application layer um, that TikTok finds itself in right now? I think we heard, you know, a, a great statement earlier this morning in the keynote that nothing should get in the way of, of the bits flowing. Um, yeah, early on in my career, I was much more in, on the hardware and networking side, working in infrastructure, uh, doing uh, network administration, also um, helping to deploy uh, citywide Wi-Fi networks. And so for me, you know, I really hold it close, um, this idea that you have maximum availability and maximum connection. Uh, going back a decade earlier, when I first got online in the early 90s, uh, you know, it was this idea that you had to, to dial into the service. And you can only talk to people on CompuServer. You can only talk to people on America Online. And so seeing how the internet grew, and as it grew, it became more inter, uh, interoperable. And with that interoperability came popularity. Uh, and so you know that's by design. And I think that sometimes folks get away from that original intent of the internet to have that resilience and to have that interoperability of always staying connected. And so anytime I see um, policy decisions that are made that, that detract from that or, or try to interfere with that, it causes me some concern because it's very difficult to come back um, from that kind of damage when you, uh, when you break up uh, the internet into a patchwork. And so I, I think that, uh, you know, from the TikTok perspective, our, our ethos is about connecting people um, and helping to empower people, um, you know, to find that creativity and to find that joy. And I, I think separating people uh, is the opposite of that. And so when we think about risk, and we've been talking quite a bit about risk in its different forms today, what other risks do you see coming from you know that fracture of, of separating people of of having the you know not necessarily firewalls in the traditional technical sense but firewalls between people in, in different geographic areas well you know it it limits the exposure um, that that creators have uh, and that users have in that reach and uh, i think that anyone who's ever been on TikTok can understand uh the idea that um, you know, you don't have to be famous on TikTok to be popular. Um, and I think it's pretty cool and something that other 
other networks haven't been able, uh, other platforms haven't been, you know, able to to crack that idea that, you know, with such a powerful recommendation system, um, anyone can be a content creator. Um, you, you don't need uh, a huge computer or uh, a lot of skill. You just need to have the passion, the creativity, to be able to make content that you find engaging, and, and hopefully other people do too. Um, but that only happens when that content is actually available to users where they are. Um, you know, it just it wouldn't work if you know the only people you could reach were the were the people that were uh, that were nearby. And so, digging in a bit more into the minutia of TikTok and how it works, you know, what part of the application is what you know makes it so popular? What builds that creator community um, of you know the we have like a generation of people now who are famous creators, but then as well as just, you know, your average person that is creating every day. Uh, it's the tools. Uh, it really is just that simplification of, uh, of tools that allow people to express themselves in a way that they weren't able to before, uh, you know, making it so that uh, those applications are fun easy to use, high quality and effective, uh, you know, so that the content that they create is something that users actually want to watch. Um, and I think part of that, you know, is really about the technology itself and understanding that technology plays a role and it plays an important role in that empowerment. Uh, and as we've discussed earlier, you know, basically all day today, uh, you know, AI is one of those technologies. Uh, it is definitely a, a powerful tool in, in terms of creativity, and it's something that we're taking seriously. Uh, and we're we're investigating ways that you know AI uh, might you know be able to help creators make that content that's more engaging. And uh, we've done something that that's industry leading. Um, in terms of artificially generated um, content. Uh, we've actually uh, just announced recently labels uh, to help users provide, um, actually to help provide more context for users in terms of the content that they are, they are consuming. Uh, so that includes creators being able to self-label uh, content that they've uh, used AI in to help make. Um, but it also means that we're exploring ways to automatically label that content uh, so that those users have that context. So it's not about saying that, you know, AI being used in a particular piece of content is good or bad, but it's about that digital literacy and educating users so that they can make that decision for themselves. And so my wheels are spinning right now. Um, and so when it comes to AI and and the new technologies and trends. How do you? I mean, if you could explain a bit more about the tools that you just mentioned, but how do you approach making sure that these aren't used maliciously um, or in a way that is harmful to people, um, and making sure that you know that it stays a positive experience because whenever you bring anyone together, there's always a risk, especially when it's en masse, the way that a platform as large as TikTok does. I think it goes back to the earlier part of our conversation where you know the, the policy discussions shouldn't be at such a low level where we're talking about you know policing certain technologies versus others. It should be more outcome-based. And so uh, at TikTok, we're looking at our community guidelines as a way to make sure that of content doesn't stay on platform. And in fact, we remove the, the vast majority of content that violates our community guidelines before our users see them. And it's just like the discussions earlier uh, today about AI. So not necessarily looking at AI being good or bad, uh, but more so uh, in that outcome-based approach to the policy discussions. And uh, again, you know, you don't want to interrupt those bits from flowing. Uh, you, you don't want to stifle that innovation so early that, that people can't find those beneficial uses and bring those to market uh, just because there's that risk that there could be some, some of those, you know, high impact uses that could have negative outcomes. And so when we, you talk about community guidelines, could you explain a bit more about what TikTok does in terms of the, because we've talked a lot about transparency today, about making the community guidelines transparent and making sure that it, they're empowering but not burdensome on the community that's on the platform. Sure. Um, you know, 
TikTok does a lot in terms of transparency. And I think it's something that um, sometimes folks may not recognize or that, that they overlook. Uh, for example, uh, we have uh, trust and accountability center, transparency and accountability centers, uh, where we actually give stakeholders a behind the scenes look into how our recommendation system works, how our content moderation uh, systems work, and, and how those community guidelines are actually uh, actioned in terms of uh, making sure that uh, the content that is on a platform actually follows our rules. And so I think that having that level of transparency is important. Um, and it's something that really shows that, you know, the industry uh, is, is willing to put in that extra effort uh, ahead of regulations uh, to be transparent and open and share, you know, how the platform actually works and how users and creators are able to, uh, to be on platform in a way uh, that follows our guidelines. And to sort of circle back both to the AI side of things and then also on that premise of, you know, signaling to the government and to regulators that you're willing to take this seriously um, and be proactive. Could you talk a bit more about the recent government codes on AI generated content um, that are, are coming to fruition, uh, a lot of which ahead of the the uh, UK summit and, and the G7 Hiroshima process? You know, as, as someone who's been in tech policy for a while, it's fascinating to see not only a, a subject capture the attention of regulators and of the public, but also uh, maintain a high level of momentum uh, to the point that I think we'll see some uh, some action. You know, if we were having this discussion last year, I'm sure we would have heard cryptocurrency uh, about as much as we're hearing AI this year. Uh, but no one's talking about cryptocurrency this year. But there is significant uh, discussion uh, and movement on artificial intelligence. And so I think that uh, on the one hand, it's a good sign to, to see regulators taking this seriously, uh, both in terms of um, being educated uh, about the technology, uh, but also um, encouraging the industry and, and different platforms and companies to make voluntary commitments ahead of these regulations. And so I think that that's all, uh, you know, moving in the right direction. Again, just you know, making sure that um, this multi-stakeholder approach continues um, through the regulatory process to make sure that we get to a place where um, you know, there's not that blanket regulation um, and that there is some attention paid to the global harmonization for those companies and platforms that need to operate all around the world. Great, thank you. Um, my wheels are spinning again. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anything else that you want to touch on uh, from uh, an internet governance side, from an AI side, uh, before we open it up to an audience question, um, before we wrap up? Well, uh, definitely want to ask you, so uh, what side of TikTok are you on? It, uh, it seems like everybody uh, <laughs> has some side of TikTok that they're on. Um, this will make my colleagues giggle. I'm definitely on Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift TikTok. Um, but I'm actually also, I've been deep in um, New York City rat TikTok because Eric Adams has a war on rats and he's losing dramatically. And people have a lot of opinions about it. And I'm, I'm really on, that's, I've spent a lot of time um, learning about it. The rats have different gangs. They have like different genetic profiles. Okay. But anyways, <laughs> this is where TikTok leads you. You learn a lot. Um, Entertaining and informative. Yes, I love it. Yes. Uh, what side of TikTok are you on? Oh, I'm, I'm easy. Uh, I love food videos. It's just like the more the better. Uh, I cook a lot. And so it's not only about, you know, learning new techniques and getting tips, but also just seeing like the wonderful creations uh, that people are able to make and then consume. So for me, uh, I just I love that visual aspect and that in that way that people are are entertaining and informative um, and it just, you know, it feels good to be able to, to watch some someone make some good food because then it gives me some ideas about what I want to do or, you know, if my skills aren't quite up for it, uh, how to find those those same foods at a restaurant. And there's a lot of good restaurant tips because I've been posting so much about Montreal recently. I've been recommended a lot of good Montreal restaurants. Um, we have only a couple minutes left. Um, I think we have time for an audience question. Dimit Pardon? 
Yes, as well. I, Dimitri, I see you with the mic, and I'll let you ask a question, and then uh, and then I'm going to rapidly let us get to our cocktail hour, so we'll do some closing remarks. Um, but I, you got the mic. All right, well, we can start here and continue during cocktails. I don't know if you can. Oh, there you go. Hi. Um, so, yeah, on one side, I think it's a little unfair that TikTok has to answer, you know, for the same kind of content uh, that has been passing through Google and Facebook and many other companies that they haven't had to answer for for many, many years. Uh, on the other hand, TikTok is a company that could not have succeeded in China because, you know, there is no Section 230 in China. You know, the provider is liable to the government for the type of content that travels through its network. So, you know, I think TikTok... Um, in generally speaking, you know, should realize its advantages uh, as well as you very well do, you know, begin to address its disadvantages because society here does not want to change Section 230. They have to come at TikTok in other ways and forbid it from, you know, phones of government employees and maybe soon children. But I think that is only one elephant in the room, and it's not the elephant I'm concerned about, because I think these kind of um, principles should be applied equally to all different companies. And what I'm more concerned about um, is this, you know, one to all communications that TikTok has enabled so greatly, you know, the ability for, you know, my child to be influenced by content that they have learned that has spawned on, on uh, TikTok as well as any other medium, but they're all on TikTok, which is why I'm addressing it. Um, have, has TikTok ever considered act, having a more proactive role in content preparation, content filtration, and maybe even different versions of TikTok that would then help uh, users to choose the type of TikTok they want and to not be susceptible to anything that might arise from anywhere? Well, we certainly take uh, mental well-being uh, seriously, and of course, uh, you know, we also take it very seriously. You know, parents having concerns about what their kids might see on platform, and so we have parental tools that are available. Uh, we recently launched that. Um, we also have, um, you know, different content. Um, available for different ages in terms of, you know, what's allowed to happen um, on platform given a particular age, if you're under 18, you know, so on and so forth. And so I think that, you know, that's that's part of it. Um, and, and there's also, uh, you know, our community guidelines, as I mentioned before, you know, you're really reducing um, the amount of content that's either going to be misleading um, or potentially harmful uh, for anyone who's on platform. And so I, I think that those are a couple of ways that we've shown that as a company, we take that very seriously and we want to make sure that whether it's the users or the parents of users, you know, they have the ability to have some control over the content um, that they're able to see. Thank you. Um uh, let's everyone give a round of applause to Maurice. Uh, thank you so much thank for you. being here today. Um, you can stay on the stage if you want. I'm going to wrap up. I'll hang out. Yeah, we'll hang out. I'm, I'm going to wrap up um, so that we can get to our cocktail hour, and I will try to keep this quick, uh, as quickly as possible, because the, who wants to keep you from the booze, from the drinks? Sorry, it's the wrong term. It's been a long day, but it's been a great day. Um, so thank you all so much for being here, both in person and on Zoom. Um, it's been amazing. Most of our speakers are still here today, and including Maurice. If you want more, have, have more questions, please stick around for the cocktail hour uh, and engage and, and ask more questions um, and chat and talk about rats or other stuff you see on the internet uh, and any of the discussions we've had today. Um, thank you so much to all of our speakers. Um, you know, we're the, you're the reason that we're all here today. Uh, we want to hear from your insights and, and connect with you. And it, it really was meaningful uh, and an amazing day. Um, you know, I hope that after today, we can continue on with the lessons we've learned about, about governance, about responsibility, about inclusion, um, both as an input and as an output in these processes and technology, um, about ethics. And, and I think today also really highlighted uh, 
the power of coming together as a community, both to discuss these issues, but then also how working together as a community is really our only path forward to making sure that we we pursue this juncture that we're at in a well-informed way um, that reflects, you know, our values and, and our Canadian values. And that I think that really that's, if that's the one thing we've learned is that coming together as a community and aligning with each other through our shared values is, is that's where our strength and our impact comes from. And that is how we'll shape the future of digital policy and internet governance. And as you know, today this slogan was the future we want. And so I hope that, you know, that message has come across. Um, and so I am obviously taking a bit of time and you want to get to your drinks. Uh, a big thank you again to our presenting sponsors, Sira and TikTok. We could not have put this all together without your support. Uh, please like give a round of applause. They've put a lot of work into this. Um, another special thank you to both my colleagues at Sira uh, and the CIGF All Hands Committee for your tremendous support in creating this event and getting here. Uh, and, and thank you for saying yes all day today and beforehand. I appreciate it. Um, thank you to ICANN and Canary for their gold sponsorship and the in-kind contribution from the Applied AI Institute. Uh, we've had note takers from the Applied AI Institute all at every session today, uh, diligently taking notes that we'll use both in Kyoto to represent Canadian priorities on the global stage this time next week um, about all of the sessions we've talked about today, as well as we're going to build up uh, uh, policy report um, that we'll share uh, with the CIGF community, with our, our colleagues in government and the private sector and civil society, um, and, and that will be published online. Um, thank you as well to uh, the Quebec Internet Governance Forum and, and CRIM for their partnership and support. Um, and before I wrap this up and ask for a round of applause and then invite you to the cocktails, also just remind you to return your uh, simultaneous interpretation headsets um, out in the hallway. You'll, you'll see where to put them before we get to our drinks. And so please just join me in giving our sponsors and volunteers and speakers a huge round of applause again. <laughs> And uh, now I invite you to go get your cocktails in the bistro. And thank you.